Here on Gateway 97.8, it's Basil and Elise Tharks, brighter sound from the heart of East Gates. Ask the neighbour here. Now, where uh, today's show is all about empowering women, and it's a special yeah. one. Uh, joining me on the line right now is my very, very special guest, Stephen Smith, celebrity hairdresser who's turned broadcaster, author, beauty journalist, columnist as well, and patron to Anna Kennedy online. So, Stephen. I love, I love that we're dedicating this to women. I think it's important <laughs> and, and, and some special women too, Aston, don't you? Oh, yes, indeed. But at the same time here, uh, Stephen, as you mentioned, do you think women get a fair deal in the workplace? Well, you, know, so you can look at it both ways. Women are fighting through. It's been a long battle. Uh, it's disgraceful. You have to battle in the first place, uh, and we have to see them as equal. Today, there was a story in the paper about a poor a, a poor cleaner working for women that was treated appallingly. So I think equally, we need to now look at the cases that some women misuse their power as much as men do, so they're quite equal. But no, I don't. I think still in this day and age, women are still treated uh, incorrectly and the officers will still have to keep fighting. But we also need to keep an eye on the women that are in power, that they're using it properly. Now, uh, do you think a man can be a feminist, as they yeah, say? Absolutely. I, just do think it, I don't think feminism is about disliking men, for starters. Uh, it's about being equal. And it's very difficult for a man in this day and age, if you're brought up properly, you're brought up to open a door for a lady, stand up when she comes in the room, the traditional values. Those are under threat. But, you know, I was talking to two ladies the other day that said they loathed it when a man took over lifting a parcel. So men, it's very difficult to know where a man is in this day and age. But I think the, uh, the, the correct thing to do is ask what they expect. You know, it doesn't do any harm. If a woman doesn't want you to uh, open the door for her, that is fine. But I, I will continue my traditional values, which is to uh, open a door for a lady, uh, if it's a heavy parcel, take over, etc. until I'm told differently. Now, uh, Stephen, we've got our first guest right on here. I'm going to introduce her because well, we've, what we've got is not just someone special to me. Uh, this lady is someone that, uh, that makes me laugh cry she's an incredible human being uh she she has uh, not only done so much to promote uh awareness in autism she's gone and written a book it's from a tear to here uh and uh I, i'm sure you're very touched by her it's your mum of course <laughs> don. don how are you I'm very well. How are you? Oh, Don, I, I'm dreaming this over the weekend. I, I can't actually tell you how proud I am of you. Oh, I, really? Words don't describe it. You know, you're, you're, you're a remarkable woman. And uh, oh, coming from such an accomplished author, that really means a lot to me. But you, you, I mean, you, that makes such, you, you're someone that people talk about doing things. Uh, and I never really get around to doing it. I mean, I don't know if you know that 9% of the population talk about writing a book, but actually only 1% actually get around to doing it. <laughs> You're one of them. But also, you you know, I'd love to always want you on my team. You fight nonstop. Now, <laughs> people don't know this, but you were originally a policewoman, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I done I done uh, special constabulary to begin with, and then decided, you know what, this is something I'd really like to do full time. But um, yeah, then I met my husband. <laughs> how, long were you, um, how long were you actually a policewoman? About only about eighteen months. Um, oh. I started the proper training, so I done all the training to get in, yeah. and there, which was about six months training, and then I was about eight mu eighteen months actually. Um, out on the beat <laughs> and then from then um, as I say it became quite difficult I'd, I'd met Keith um, yeah. things change you know the hours was long and so hat off to every police person out there oh my god uh, yeah, hat off entirely you know it's an amazing uh, I know we're watching, we're watching Line of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> Hands off to them all. Yeah, definitely. So your, your book, From a Tear to Here. Um, so how do you put this? When did you, you're a young mum, full of hopes, and, uh, uh, and when did you notice there might be something a little bit different about your pride and joy? Um, obviously, because Aston was a second child, um, having had Aaron everything went you know textbook yeah with Aston actually from quite a young age I realized that he didn't like to be swaddled if he you know he'd cry more if you pick him up to cuddle him 
Um, so there was like there was alarm bells ringing pretty much early on, and then kind of as he got into his toddling, uh, it started to really materialise. Uh, family members had started to notice a difference. Um, he wasn't talking. We initially like. I initially thought there was a problem with his hearing, which I think is quite common with um, most parents will, will probably go down that same route. Um, but my dad, my dad had picked something up about autism. What age did you hear the hearing you were talking about? What age did you notice there was something not right with the hearing? Very young, about six, seven months old. Um, you know, he could be laying in his cot and there could be loud, a loud noise or, you know, you'd, you'd call to him and he wouldn't turn. There, there wasn't that sort of interaction. So quite early on, really, yeah. And as it has progressed, uh, when, when did he first turn to, to look for help? It was before he was actually diagnosed. As a family, I found it was so, so difficult. And I'm actually helping a family now. And I, I look at them and I can so see where we were at that time. Yeah. You, you kind of, um, part of you wants to just keep muddling on, you know, this is my son. I'll, I'll make sure things are right. And Keith was very much like that. Um, but I was at home all day, every day. And... Um, he was he'd started to self-harm etc from a very young age so it was one of them that I thought right I really need to um, <laughs> I need help you see you're talking about because for, for other parents listening you're talking about self-harm we always think visually of a grown-up uh of eating disorder no. so, so what way was asked in self-harm in a compound for um he was later to be diagnosed with pika but at the time he was biting literally all anything in there, any inedible object, Aston would chew and eat. So he, he was just constantly biting himself. I'd go into the cot um, and there'd be blood on the cot where he's chewed part of his feet, his hands. Um, inanimate objects was was a very big, you know, like he, clothing. If we could get clothing on him, he'd generally eat his way out of it. He'd eaten his way through... Um, we, we moved him from a cot because he'd eaten his way from the cot into a cabin bed. He ate his way through that. We moved him into his brother's and got his brother another. In the end, you know, it, it became um, really apparent that the people was just as, as difficult to deal with. Oh, so as John, John, for people who don't understand that, well, Pika, what is Pika exactly? It's, um, it's an eating, uh, it, people that crave and need to eat. Um, I don't know if you've heard pregnant women that maybe eat brick. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. Or it, it's something in their system that craves them to eat a, a particular material. For Aston, it was most things, including himself. He never, he never bit other people. He's always <laughs> been good at heart, <laughs> so he wouldn't hurt anybody else, <laughs> but himself so so much. His brother's, um, his brother's homework. You know, like there was all sorts. Um, so I think with the autism, what happened was that the pika manifested itself and then just got 10 times worse because... Don, we... Don, how much was it a fight to get help in the system for, for Aston? I was actually, I'll be honest, we've been very, very lucky. And anyone that reads the book will see that. Um, we had the best medical team. I, I actually, because of, as you say, reaching out, we reached out, out to social services quite young, uh, quite young age. Yeah. A lot of people will turn their backs on social services because you think of, are oh, they there um, to take my child away? They yeah. wasn't. They actually assisted me in more ways than in so many ways. They opened so many doors and, um, yeah, totally. We reached out to them first, health visitors, doctors I had the greatest education team around us so you know we I know a lot of parents now have to fight but we was lucky enough not to be in that mm -hmm. position I'm going to ask this question um I mean we're, we're lucky we have Anna Kennedy around us and, and yeah. what's that what happens to kids that parents just don't care or don't want to know or don't want to get them help it doesn't bear thinking about because these these kids that like these children need um, they need self esteem they need self belief mm -hmm. um, they they need that that input and yeah it, you know that you I'm constantly constantly putting into Aston telling him how great he is you know sometimes I think I've created my own monster 
but you you have to do that to make them feel great. <laughs> No, I can bear the thought my, my, my wonderful Aston. Uh, I mean, he's, he's, he's got, I mean, he's the most incredible human being uh, and, he's, and he's got the support of two such wonderful, uh, such a family that you, you couldn't quite believe. But uh, what was your advice for, for mums that round about, say, uh, discovering that the child may have uh, be a little bit different and uh, what, what, can, what what's the first step you can take to try and get help? Well, I reached out, as I say, to social services because, as a family, it was affecting it was affecting Aaron, it was affecting our marriage. Yeah. Uh, you know, everything was um, because we had the health issues as well. So I reached out to social services. I also spoke with the consultant because the first thing to do is get the review. Get <laughs> you know, if it's not a diagnosis, get them on that that ladder to a diagnosis. So you know, one, you know what you're dealing with, and secondly, the help comes with that. So yeah, most definitely. As so it depends on what area you live in, you know, what, what help you can get, or is it? I think actually, like most things, yeah, it's a postcode lottery. As I say, we've been extremely, extremely lucky. Um, now, you're, you're, as I've said to you before, you are one of the most incredible women I've ever met. I, mean, I just, you know, you're a fight, you're a fighter, and and of course, here we are. You have not. Uh, you have written a book now. On top of I can't it. believe it. I actually don't know how you have the time to write a <laughs> book because I know what it takes to write one of these. It does. <laughs> Tell me about how you decided to do this. I'd started to write a little bit of poetry actually, sort of early on, and I was documenting things with Aston because things were so difficult. Like you know, it it was almost like my own therapy. Yeah. So I'd write things down as as therapy and it kind of, the book evolved. So I'd started from when he was about five or six. I mean, the first poem I wrote, he was two and a half. Um, but the actual start in the book, he was quite young. And I it, it kind of evolved as time went on. The more that he achieved, the more I felt people need to see where this, this young man started. They need mm -hmm. to understand that at that point, everybody was giving up on him you know he, he'd go in he'd, he'd have to go residential care he won't do this he won't do that and we're like hang on you know let's not say what he won't do let's look at what he can do yeah. and yeah. look at what he's achieved and from that I felt like people had to know this person and not just that, what about your journey I mean it, it's it's not easy is it you know it's not, no. you you have stood by and it's your journey as well which i think is important as well it's both your journey it's uh, a family and, journey family yeah. journey but yeah. it's not everyone that, that can do this uh and you you, you have managed uh i think aston's got something to say about oh what yeah. yes i have Stephen. you mentioned uh poetry there Stephen. so it's time to read one of the uh poems out that i've seen on here in front of me it's uh based around lockdown that we've been under for about over a year which is uh it is tough, it has to be said, but uh, it goes, a year has passed from that faithful day. The day we got locked down, a year has passed and time's moved on and still an empty town. So many lost their loved ones dear. So many there still mourn. On this day, 12 months ago, some new lives have been born. We all miss celebrations. We missed our family dear. We missed their passing and their births. We lived our lives in fear. For now, we must continue to stay safe and stay apart. A year has passed, but believe me, each one of you are in my heart. I never would imagine the aches I feel each day. For all that we have missed, the work, the rest, the play. Life has not been normal. A year has come and gone. I am thankful I am still writing this. It means that through this, I stayed strong. I think we all need to reflect to look at this past year. Remember those no longer with us. Remember past times dear. Now look to the future of what it has in store. 12 months ago, each one of us could never have been sure. Take a moment of your day to recall a year that's passed. Be thankful for tomorrow. This lockdown cannot last. Time is moving on now. The light is shining through. In time, we can all reflect and dream of memories new. Oh, 
Well, we we need a book. We need a book of poems from you, now, Don. <laughs> <laughs> but Don, you've said this is your therapy, or been part of your therapy, and, and what's come out of it is an incredible book. And I recommend everyone to to read it. And you don't Thank have you. to have a family member living with autism. All you have to have is is a, a bit bit of oh. empathy, uh, and 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 it's just a wonderful story and anyway. But listen, we're talking about. Other parents, and not just mothers, because sometimes there's a lot of emphasis on the mother and fathers. How do you recommend being able to take downtime for yourself uh, if you're dealing with a situation where you're looking after a family member? You do. You everybody needs that downtime. You need, you know, like I, I actually enjoy just going to lay in a bath. Sometimes lay in a bath, glass of prosecco, <laughs> candles burning. <laughs> Oh you, you, you need time out you need to remember who you you are because you've got to be strong to then be able to put everything you can uh, in, into your young person because if you've got to experience burnout which is easy to do isn't it uh then exactly. you're going to be good uh for you know i know anna kennedy has her zumba classes uh which she loves doing and, and, and other but it's important because sometimes it's very easy to be dragged into uh a, a situation where you suddenly have wake up and you've got burnout and you're, you're no yeah good, but that's uh, why i write Stephen. that's why yeah. i do my poetry and so yeah everybody's got that thing well, i think aston has got a question now haven't you well well this is uh one thing right here i have to say but uh if you was to appear on television down the line Obviously, fame has to come into play somewhere, as they say. <laughs> but, uh, really what, what's a TV program would you do if you had the choice to strictly come dancing? I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here, or dancing on ice. Definitely strictly. Oh, <laughs> it be on ice. <laughs> and I can't, I can't dream of eating strange objects. I know you'd be breaking <laughs> <ass. laughs> I just can't, I can't see Don in the junk. <laughs> I do ask. I can see you having a nice dance. So they think she would enjoy. What about my lashes? <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 how can people get hold of the book? Uh, right, okay. So the book's available on our website, www.teamaveryessex.com. Yeah. It's also available on the Anna Kennedy online website. Yeah. www.annakennedyonline.com uh, Born Anxious are now doing that because Aston's yeah. wearing a lovely t-shirt that they're also doing for yeah, us. I love that t-shirt. Um, so it's on the www.bornanxious oh, website. There's a clothing, you've got your, your, the, the, the book has its own clothing line. It does, yes. <laughs> 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 From a tear to here. <laughs> From a tear to here. <laughs> Obviously, Gateway. Gateway are stocking it. And actually, Stephen, yeah. now's the time to actually announce that the 29th of May, yeah. I'm going to be going into um, Gateway Radio. Yeah. And between 11 and 1, I'm doing a book signing. Oh, my God, that'd be brilliant. <laughs> oh, that's really good. A secco in hand. <laughs> <laughs> Are you allowed to drink at a radio station these days? I don't know. I'm sure there. I'm sure there'll be a way. It's fizzy water. <laughs> oh, Don, it's been so nice, uh, and, and I love the book. Thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I can't wait to see you properly. And I, I'm, I'm coming down on the. I think the 11th. Yeah. So I'm hoping you're going to be around. Uh, and it's because... near your birthday, I believe. Oh, so my, this is my birthday month, as they say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be 60 this year. No! Yeah, so I've just started writing about it. <laughs> my therapy for becoming 60. <laughs> Shocking. Shocking, <Yeah>. Aston. <laughs> no. Right, I have to say, Dawn, thank you for joining Stephen and I for today. Hi, Mum. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>